I remember doing it with 3D when we were younger, and um, he's colourblind, so it was like we used to have to write the colours on for him. Really? Wow. Uh, but we used to have a laugh because we used to chuck in the wrong colour and oh, like, yeah. kind of like we could mess Brown. around. Yeah, so he <laughs> was, he's, so he was colourblind, so it was like, and if you look at a lot of the early Massive Attack artwork, he, he would do a painting and reverse the photo, the negative, and use that as the artwork. Living the dream, really. Mm. You know, I, it was, uh, they were the halcyon days, man. Mm. They were, they were, it was before, before the internet, it was before uh, camera and video phones. Was this around manumission time? This was, was yeah, yeah. I mean, I got to be the resident DJ for for, for, for the biggest and with unquestionably the greatest club night ever, manumission. Mm -hmm. Huge. Which was, uh, yeah, was it was like it was like Disney World for adults, man. It was phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, X rated, highly rated. Mm. Uh, it was brilliant. <laughs> KillerKellerOfficial.com You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top five, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Alrighty, here we go. Ladies Alrighty. and gentlemen, Killer Keller, podcast live and direct central London, as central as you need to be, choose to be, want to be, you don't want to be anywhere else, god damn it, big shout <laughs> to all the originators of people that are sharing and caring in the pursuit of street culture and all the arts. Big shouts yourselves as well. Hold tight to everyone's got the Kellervision app, free download, iPhone, Android for your street culture sports, whether it's mini docs, full docs, DJ mixes, or the notorious podcast, we got you. Um, big shout out to our sponsors, the mighty Hoddle Warriors crew over at the Crypto Moon Boys hideout. That's some NFT business for you. And here we are again. But this time we're in a very special place. I'm in a very cosy place. This is my cosy place where I've got one musician and I've got one graffiti writer, both dynamically gifted in all different genres, but this is their specifics, you understand. If you're into the big beat DJ culture, we have Derek Delage inside the place. And if you're into your street art from a Bristol side, big up Bristol Massive, it's inky inside the place. Yes, yes, yes. How are we, gentlemen? Very good, thank you. A bit chilly, but I've got the thermals on, sir. So. We were just discussing, you used to live down these parts in Kew, didn't it? Yeah, just actually across the road. I was in Kensal Rise and kind of made a railway for 20-odd years. 20 yeah, years. I was up here working, doing Sega. So I worked in Chiswick at the video games company down there and then Soho with Xbox. Wow. Yeah, on and off. Through the birth of Dreamcast, launch of Xbox, back wow. round to the Phoenix of Sega Rise, that, yes. Right in the early yeah. days. yeah. And you've been here for a little while too, haven't you, Dee? Yeah, I mean, sort of from Labrook Grove, sort of to Kensal Rise to Queen's Park, yeah, for since the early 90s, mm. really, yeah. 93, I think I moved to Labrook Grove. We actually crossed paths in the gym. That was how we went even yeah. still to this day. Yeah, even now, yeah. We, I see you all the time in the gym, man. Yeah, you always manage to get in there before me. <laughs> Are you walking in? Kellerisms! And I'm yeah, like, no, yeah, he's there, he's there. Yeah, it's always a demon. <sighs> but you, you've lived around here for a while, haven't you? Yeah. It's Absolutely, been a yeah. Haunt for a long this time. This has been my hood, for, yeah, for about coming up to two decades now, twenty odd years, yeah. What is it about Northwest, fellas? What is it about Northwest being this um, this epicenter of? I think there was a lot of when I moved there. There was a lot of lot, lot of the West Country, Bristol lot. You're working in film and TV, obviously, because of the BBC, and you've got all the studios mm. like on the west side of London. Um, you had acting studios, obviously. Pine was a bit further out. Uh, and I think there was a whole community around Labbert Grove and, uh, and also it was just easy to get back to Bristol from West London so, uh, so a lot of people can you know it's another hour on your journey if you live east so uh, yeah. Yeah. logistics yeah I can see yeah. why that would work this place always holds dear to a lot of hip hop you know old school it's one of the first places where hip hop landed wasn't mm. it you know, the west the west side of, of, of London and outwards um, you're from Leicester originally aren't you? Okay. well originally I was born in Northern Ireland I left there when I was a baby I grew up in Leicester. Uh, that's where I went to school. Mm. That's where I grew up. I left Leicester when I was 15, went back to Ireland for a year, and then I moved to London. So, yeah, I, mm. I, I, I like to class myself. I'm Irish, but I'm a Londoner, but mm. but, but I grew up in Leicester. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's got a lot. Not complicated at all. <laughs> Not a lot of fusion in there. <laughs> uh, what's the graffiti event that happens up in Leicester at the moment? So, there was Return of the Mac, was the first one, which was uh, mm. Stella One Boyd. Put no, on. Big up that Stella was one. about. 98, 99 or something. Mm. It's around the same time we did Walls on Fire in Bristol. And then there was the recent ones called Bring the Paint, which is run by Graph HQ. 
That's Great it. names, aren't they? So those guys have kind of brought Leicester back into the forefront of the graffiti scene mm. and they've put on one of the best graffiti events I've seen recently. Mm. There's probably about 200 artists. There was people painting all over the city in the middle of the day, just... It was amazing. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely recommend else. that if that's on again this year. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and this is why it's so, you know, pivotal having two guys from two of these specific areas of the UK in because, again, the, the graph pedigree coming from both Leicester and um, Bristol. I mean, Bristol, Inky, you're one of the... Let's put in context, people, for those of you just jumping in on this and don't know the, you know, the, the, <coughs> the, the legitimacy of our guests here. Like, Inky, you're one of the... In my mind, you're one of the pioneers that stepped out of Bristol, that um, championed the, the, the culture as a whole. Come on, in that, yeah, in that I mean, we had, we had kind of a weird scene in Bristol because uh, before the internet, we were kind of slightly isolated and cut off. So we were kind of inventing... We were getting a lot of New York stuff because there was a lot of Jamaican guys in Bristol, our relatives. Uh -huh. So they were bringing mm -hmm. like, mixtapes and the hip-hop flyers and we were seeing photos of occasionally. Uh, but apart from Subway Art and a few videos and like hip-hop history, mm. it was all just TV-based or film-based stuff. Mm. And then coming to London, we occasionally come up here, we come in West London especially to see all the graph. We then go home and have to kind of like cook it in a pot and come up with our own stuff. So mm. we came up with a slightly different thing. There wasn't so many trains running in Bristol, so the illegal scene was more on walls, mm. on buses and that. Um, nowadays, it's kind of taken another turn where it's gone a bit more underground again mm, I've uh, noticed but it's that it's absolutely just like smashed at the moment in the city so really yeah it's everywhere and you get a lot of people coming there from other places so mm. I think the networking thing since the internet's come has completely changed the game so, so mm. like, we were just you know I'd go to Amsterdam or like Paris wait around by Hall of Fame to you met someone then you'd swear you know send letters through John Nations at Barton Hill mm -hmm. and we built up a kind of portfolio of photos that was like our interpersonal the internet or library that other artists could come and look at but we had co like huge contacts with Leicester mm. Hull Birmingham a few London guys like Amsterdam Paris Berlin all over that's crazy uh, see what you had your own like historically recorded documented yeah John Nation archives was, yeah we had a guy who was like an archivist but he was actually the youth worker at the club that we were all painting at brilliant called John Nations and if you look at his um, Instagram John Nations he every day is putting out classic stuff from London LA he was chatting to like Henry Chalfont James Prigoff all the photographers so he was swapping photos of Bristol stuff and all sharing all the world stuff that's crazy and yeah. the, as you were just talking then, I suddenly, you know, the recesses of the music in the scene over there from Portishead to That's Ronnie exact. to... Ridiculous, yeah. man. And, you know, Massive Attack uh, being associated with Graf so heavily as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, also, look, because obviously D was in a crew with Tats. So Tats came in about 85 with T-Kid, Vulcan, Nicer, mm -hmm. all that shame. Mm -hmm. So we met all those guys earlier, but then obviously you had, like, Chrome Angels, I think, like, uh, Pride, and that came down, painted a couple of times. They did an exhibition in 85. But Pride's a bad man, isn't he? Oh, he's sick. Yeah, so seeing all that stuff early on, we were getting introduced to UK stuff and America stuff, and they had a little melting pot going on. So mm, mm. It was kind of, like, early days. It died off a bit after we all got busted. And then I think the college, with the music scene and the, the, the college there, you had a load of artists came to Bristol to go to college, because of the music, because it was trendy, mm. but also it created the, the scene sort of mushroomed again, so that's around the time of the school collective and all those kind of Will Barris, Jago, mm -hmm. Sick Boy, mm. there was like, Steph Platts, people like that, there was all that kind of scene going on, so that's kind of then boosted it again, so you've got graffiti and street art on two different platforms. Crazy. Um, parlor talk, undivided attention. Yeah. These rap crews, UK yeah, hip hop yeah. rap crews, yeah, yeah. they were some of my favourite human beings, man. Yeah. And a rapper called Awkward. Awkward, yeah, he's still going, yeah, he's Big still doing. Awkward. Yeah, he does DJing as well, and yeah. he's making a lot of music. Um, he had, was it, Numbskulls and that as well? Numbskulls, Sir Beans. Yeah, Sir Beans, all that. There was a whole load Big of them. Big up Steve, yeah. yeah. A lot of them were just, you know, they're obviously grown up with kids now, but some of their music they made back then was incredible. Exactly. And obviously, you had, like, Mr. B was doing some of the artwork for them. Mm hmm. Which is an elephant, obviously, with the kind of the whole Banksy effect of him being there. Um, he moved up here in about '98. Correct me, was we, was Banksy in Bristol? In Bristol Massive? Was he in Bristol Massive first? Uh, no, he was in uh, Dry. Was Dirty Rotten Apples crew? I think it was. Right. Which okay. was with Loki and stuff like and Kato right, and got soccer you. and that. And then um, he was doing mainly graph when I met him. Mm. You crossed uh, ropes with him a few times, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Telling yeah. me that, man. Yeah, yeah, we did the thing down by. Um, 
uh, by on the way into Paddington swinging on ropes and he did a monkey with his finger and I went straight over it with my letters. Really? And we had a bit of a row around. But that's how I kind of met Derek in a way because he was using the Warner Sound um, stock room yeah. as his studio just under the Westway. Right. And obviously I see Derek being yeah. up in the office there as I'll well. Be in the office, so like yeah. All those kind of guys that I met through that. And he shared the office with, yeah. with Mrs. Jones, which was yeah. Mark's wife at the yeah, time. Who's yeah. an amazing designer. She yeah. makes the most Fee, outrageous clothes. Yeah. Fee, yeah, Fiona. So that was like, yeah. if, what a hub of creativity that place was. Yeah. We had, Water Sound. We had, we, had, well, we had Water Sound there, and then the sort of like, the extension of the office across the road was Banksy. He had one sort of side of this studio, and Fiona had the other side of it, so they shared a studio. Oh my and whoever God. moved in that studio after them must have been laughing, because yeah. there was loads of Banksy's, like, he, he just did stuff on the wall. He was just taking the old record sleeves and doing like, testing, yeah, he, he customised the record yeah. sleeves and no stuff like that. Way. What, just yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure out. underneath there as well, because there was a few mere pieces and that, and there was a few of the London guys that painted underneath. But then, um, was he still there when they had the Mutate, Mutate Britain thing down there as well? He might, have moved, he might have moved out by then. Was remember when they had the big Mutate thing under the Westway? Uh, no, I don't Mutate remember that. Slot came in with oh, the whole yeah, I remember this. And there was a big exhibition with yeah, Mo yeah, too and all that. Totally, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I, I remember, remember that. he did a thing. I remember he, he did a big thing in SE1. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was on outside cargo. But the whole thing, I mean, for me about the Portobello was you had JB who'd run the film festival. Mm -hmm. He'd be bringing over like Black Lerat and people like that as yeah. well, and all these artists oh, and sick boys. Because he was like, yeah. if you look at Black Lerat stuff, you can see where, I'm yeah. not saying Banksy ripped him off, but you can see yeah. the influence, yeah. can't you? Mm. But it was weird because Black Lerat was painting underneath the Westway, and I think when he had the studio in there and they wow. didn't know each other. Because yeah. mm. there's, there's, <laughs> that there's that great Banksy piece yeah. up opposite the studio where the Falafel King was. It's still there yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. got the, uh, sort of it's got the, the like, the artist of the axle, yeah. do you know what I mean? No way. And it says Banksy. Yes, I've seen it, you can still course, see it. Yeah. They've got, they've got the Perspex sort of, sort of cover on it now to shield it, the, the see-through one. Yeah. They get damaged quickly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Del, man, honestly, to, to have you having, sitting here with us, it's good to it's be a here. It's a rarity, man. Because like, is. he's always flat. You're always in and out, always in and out. But now you're in between us. You can't move. And <laughs> nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide. <laughs> nowhere, to, nowhere to run to. Your history is cemented, in my mind anyway, with that Wall of Sound era, that that big beat. A superstar DJ era. Genuinely, genuine superstar yeah. era. You, I, you, I'm you in the book, it. the superstar DJ's book. Yeah, no, I mean, it was uh, living the dream, really. Mm. You know, I, it was... Uh, to be someone that used to DJ, used to warm up at clubs and play at your mates parties and things like that, to be... I mean, I was fortunate enough to... I think I was in the right place at the right time. I, I made a record that was that was really successful and that sort of catapulted me into that world and it, it all happened really quickly. Mm. And you know what? I thought it would last forever. Mm -hmm. but, but nothing does. But, I mean, when it was good, it was good. They, they, were, they were the halcyon days, man. Mm. They, were, they were. It was before... Before the internet, it was before uh, camera and video phones. Was this around manumission time? This was, was yeah, yeah. I mean, I got to be the resident DJ for for, for, for the biggest and with unquestionably the greatest club night ever, manumission. Mm -hmm. Huge. Which was, uh, yeah, it was it was like it was like Disney World for adults, man. It was phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, X rated, highly rated. Uh, it was brilliant. I lived in the manumission motel, which which. Uh, do you know Elk? Yeah. yeah. He, he spray painted all the halls. Fully enough, I, I hadn't been back to Ibiza in years, and I was staying in this hotel called Esviv, and I yeah. came out and there was loads of his artwork being sprayed yeah, all over the place oh, yeah. in the hotel. You know what I mean? Yeah. So Have they just done a book about that? The whole um, hotel, the Man the Man Mission the, the, Hotel. They're making a book yeah. at the moment. Yeah. 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 Wow. I wonder how much. Yeah. I know that Elk did all the hallways and he, stuff. He spray like, painted I the think halls. I yeah. might have been involved as well. I, don't, I can't remember. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, he can't remember. I don't think anyone can remember any of that. Like, so, well, was it? Yeah. It's a bit like the sixties, isn't it? Or yeah. the seventies? If 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 you can remember it, you weren't there. But yeah. no, I mean there was. Uh, no, I've got many memories, but no photos. Really, no photos. But these no. memories must be, you know, sepia with crazy oh, debauchery shit. and uh, absolute. Like I said, it was carnage. It was, you know, it was. Yeah, the party never stopped. Mm. You know, the party never stopped. You know, one minute you're on the, one minute you you're partying with El McPherson in, in in your room, and the next minute you're you're on the dance floor with Kate Moss and Sean Ryder, and in uh, Jean Paul Gaultier and oh. Grace Jones, and it's just just insane. You know what I mean? Howard Marks uh, hanging out with him, God rest his soul. What a yeah. cool guy he was. You know, he was part of the Manumission Mission massive for a while. He just 
the, his book, Mr. Nice, had just come out. So to hang out with mm. him, man, what a dude he was, you know. I'll tell you what, man, like to pole vault, it'd been pole vaulted so quickly into the public eye like that, to the partying eye. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would have had this at least yeah. six months of imposter syndrome. Like, what the fuck's going oh, on? Oh, yeah, I mean, it, it, you don't realise when you're in it, do you know mm. what I mean? I mean, obviously, uh, when you're in all the magazines and you're on MTV and... I mean, I didn't have a television in Ibiza, do you know what I mean? Mm. But everyone over here, people were coming back and telling me, like, oh, you're not seeing this and you're not seeing yeah. this. Like, you know, I, I, I'm... You know, I was... You, you're just in a bubble. You're just in... You, yeah, you're in your own bubble. It was, but it was brilliant. I mean, I wouldn't change a thing about it. It was, it was great. Really? It, yeah, it was, it was, it was fucking hilarious. It must have been like PTSD <laughs> coming off the ride like that. That must have just been right straight. Oh yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> basically, it was the millennium, the turn of the millennium. Mm. That's when everything sort of nosedived. Really? Yeah, I mean, it was pretty much like the music, the music had stopped. The lights, was that, come, was that the lights it, had come on and everyone had gone home. <laughs> do you think that was yeah. when it all went digital, though, when it all like uh, changed over from being like, like, people stuff. buying records to like yeah. downloading stuff? Mm. Well, I never thought of it like that, but that's about when that's about the time when it yeah. happened, isn't it? Probably would have been around the time. Mm. Yeah. You guys, before we put them record, I was trying to yeah. I was trying to make them stop. You understand? It was impossible. These guys go back a long way, like rocking chairs. Um, but they were talking you know, <laughs> historical reference points of when you first caught yeah. eye on graffiti and when you were first coming down here and, you know, the records of the time, Bomb the Bass and and such and record yeah. covers that inspired you because you are into graph. You're, yeah, you're I love it, man. Head, I love it. You? We've been to a few shows. We went to the one down That's at Trellick, right. didn't we? It's yeah. It's looking great, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who's the artist? It's almost like the, it's just the... the uh, Indigenous ones, you know. Oh, oh mate. Have you seen it? It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's sick. I forget her name. Comment below. You, you know who you are. She's brilliant. Yeah, Not Dale, Dale Grimshaw, no. Uh... It's, it's a girl and a guy. Yeah. I, think they, they're, they're, I think they're from out of country. I don't think they're from around here. I mean, I spotted they're it from... Awesome. His, there was loads of stuff going on. Do, do, you know, is it... The Gardens of Trellick Tower, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have a graph thing there. Uh, but uh, the moment we walked collective. in there... The, the, uh, it's one collective event, yeah. There's about... So there was about 20 artists in there, but I just zoned in on this one, do you know yeah. what I mean? They were all... I didn't see anything there I didn't like, but this was... I took some photos of it. I'll have to find them on my phone. But, yeah, I, 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 yeah I've always been fascinated by it. Do you mm. know what I mean? Even as a kid, you know, when I first saw it, when I, you know, when I just first saw those those images of of New York in the late 70s and the, the early 80s, I mean, even from... from uh, Watching the Warriors and stuff like that, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and you first it's, introduced to it. And I yeah. think it was, was it Buffalo Girls? And all that, mm. Duck Rock yeah, and all that. Malcolm Duck Rock and the cover. Yeah. The first one I ever recall seeing was The Clash. There was a Combat Rock. Yeah. And inside the cover, with Futura did all the sleeve notes. And he threw the, there's a ghetto blaster and stuff. And if you check it, it's got Futura 2000 sleeve notes. Wow. And then I think, because I chatted to him later about this, and he said he went on tour with them. And he had his own song, Futura 2000, mm. and he said, but they had the Clash had to stand in front of the because all the punks were spitting on him. Yeah. He didn't realise that he thought it was rude, but it was out of respect. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it was, uh, it was kind of bizarre. That's mental, I was in the punk at the time. I think it was that, and then hip, like I say, arena hip hop history. Because the whole thing, that, the whole thing in in New York was like punk and, yeah. and hip hop and Don Letts and obviously the reggae Don, Don all came together, together didn't well, it? So it was like that, he was closely connected to all that. Yeah. It was that kind of clash, bringing over the hip-hop thing over yeah. to here, and they were taking punk and reggae and yeah, blending and, the whole three. In New York, they were having all those those trendy parties in downtown, but they went and got the, like, the hip-hop DJs and the, and the artists and the graffiti yeah. artists. I think it was to from right? uptown the fun, to fun house Gallery. That's to, right, and they were transferring, yeah. basically, the, the hip-hop DJs from the disco ones. They were kind of trying to yeah. integrate and bring them into different yeah. folds of society, which, which kind of had the effect, because then Blondie came along. Yeah. And, and this is my curious question because Fab Five Freddy shouted out on the record, um, Rapture. But I'm getting the impression, and I could be wrong, that when she calls him Fab Five Freddy, tells me everybody's five. Because he wasn't in the graffiti crew Fab Five. He wasn't in Fab Five as a writer, was he? I don't think he was in Fab Five as a writer, no. So, no I don't think he was actually a writer, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. So how did... She may have got the terminology wrong and called uh, him Fab Five Freddy. I think Freddy a lot of stuff could have got lost in translation yeah. back then, couldn't it? But... I was saying earlier on, there's an amazing documentary on at the moment, uh, Fight the Power, mm. How Hip Hop Changed the World. Mm. And they're talking about the uh, the young kids in New York, they couldn't get into the club, so they had their own parties, the, the whole yeah. block party thing. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to, obviously didn't want to dress like the people who were into disco. But they were saying hip hop is the bastard child of disco. 
Do you know what I mean? That's what they were saying. Because they couldn't get in. They were yeah, they, 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 well, a lot of them would have been black and Hispanic, so that rules you yeah, out. Yeah. Unless you're obscenely wealthy, you're not going to get in them clubs, mm. you know what I mean? But it's those contrasts of play, yeah. social contrasts that actually gave birth to, like you say, the punk era. I guess over here in the UK, we, we, we migrate, well, we, we had it migrate, but then we started, you know, Scar came along. Yeah. Which then really bonded the kind of unity within the communities, and then hip hop just was the deal sealer, wasn't it? Mine was always I was sort of punk, a bit of two tone, a bit of ska. Mm. Yeah, I liked a bit of reggae, and I guess hip hop. When I first saw it, I was more into the graffiti. Mm. It was more about being anarchist and painting. You could do what you wanted. Yeah, a bit of a fuck you. I'm going to paint on this wall. Yeah, yeah. They, they I was go, doing because I was doing like Clash logos and all the band, the Dead Kennedys and that. And then the then the hip hop yeah. took over, and I gradually went from bondage trousers into like you know slightly flared well, jeans. Well, I mean, I was a punk for about a week, <laughs> and then I went back to being a sort of a sort of. I went to my my first school disco. I was going to go as a punk, but I ended up going. Uh, I looked a bit like Brian Ferry. I was a kind of funky, a funky new romantic, you know. But then, come on, I, uh, some, some levels. For me, come the on. first time I heard the message. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'd always loved music. I was into reggae anyway because I used to listen to the Rank MSP really late on Sunday nights. You know, I hated uh, I hate I hated Mondays when I was a kid. I hated, you know, I mean, I didn't like school. I, I just, and they didn't like me. Do you know what I mean? I was I was really disruptive at school. Really? So school was shit, you know what I mean? I didn't like it. But the ranking Miss P made 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 the the coming of Monday really easy because mm-hmm. I used to listen to to our she used to have a show on uh, on Radio One on Sunday night. So I was into reggae. There was always music in our house anyway. But when I on the, when I first heard the message, do you know what I mean? Mm. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. I never heard anything like it. You know what I mean? I think that was one of the first times I saw scratching properly done like that as well. When the, that was the first footage you saw of it. Mm. Because um, obviously it was going on before then, but yeah. I think that was the first time you might have seen it on top of the pops or like, because we didn't have much channels for this sort of stuff. No. Mm. I think what was it before? The Word at the time was the one word, of those shit. Yeah. The Word. Yeah. Well, yeah, of course, The Word and yeah. Dance Energy. Or the, was it the there tri- would have been a few things on the old Grey Whistle test, I would imagine, really oh, early, whistle, early, early. early the, f- the first time I ever saw was was anybody doing anything like that was oh. the guy from Manchester called Greg Wilson. Greg Wilson, he's still doing it with the tapes and that, yeah, and but, Chad but, Jackson as well. But but he was doing oh, it, cool. you know. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he was he was mixing with the two turntables. I think it was on it was I think it was on the old Grey Whistle Test or it was one of them programs, yeah. you know, a really really old program. I think a lot of these disciplines is like the, the first question you ask as a young person is like how, like how do you get how do you get that piece looking the way using the you know the facilities and the the the, the um, cans and paint that you you have available readily available yeah. in car car sh- stores. Like, how do you get it looking so amazing? And it's the same with DJing. You know, these are basic, you know, basic uh, instruments to be using and making scratch yeah. noises from. But and you know, your dad would rarely let you. Back in the day, at least, he would rarely let you touch Especially the fucking thing. If you had thing. a belt drive. Mm. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Imagine yeah. trying to do it on that. Yeah. Mm. I think it's changed, like, obviously, like, from, from my side of things, like, the paint and issue we had was, you know, it was pretty rubbish, the caps were pretty rubbish, but you got around those issues and... It's part of the art, Just practised it, it and but we didn't really have fat caps or anything, so it was all really slow and, like... And nowadays, you've got this lovely portfolio of different nozzles and cans mm. and different paints. I guess it's the same with the DJing thing, you know, you were, before you had a raw deck, or the Technics was, I think, was the ultimate one. Mm. Now yeah. you've got these CDJs with all these different buttons that you can do all your samples mm. and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, um, it's kind of a completely different game. Oh, it's complete. Yeah. It's, I mean, I've uh, I've had a go on CDJs. Yeah. But it's mm. really alien to me, man. Mm-hmm. And it's something I need to embrace because, you know, that's the it's that, that's just the way it is now. You know, it, if you arrive at a club, uh, I mean, for me, I can't really DJ playing vinyl unless the promoter yeah. is a vinyl DJ. Yeah, because you arrive in like. You've got, got two, you've, got, you? you've got two turntables sitting there that have been basically used as ashtrays and someone has been resting their laptop on them yeah. for yeah. the past 20 years. They're, 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 they're fucked, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're just old bangers, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They don't work. But, but uh, do you find with that, because obviously you've got the Serato stuff as well now, and what's the other way, is it Raid, where you've got the... Um, rain, yeah. Raid, where you've got the little thing that spins around. Yeah, yeah, with the long... If you yeah. digitise stuff... Do you find it the same when you're doing mixing with vinyl? I've tried now. Yeah. It, it, it is kind of different. I mean, do you I, hear the yeah. glitch on it from a from a midi point of view that it's it's definitely it's just alien. Digital. It's just yeah. alien. The whole fact that you're not taking a record out of a cover, putting it on, and queuing yeah. it up is, and it's like when you know what you're going to play next, you have to scroll down all these lists. It's not it's not like 
Because it, uh. I suppose you have you have, a, you have a six sense as a DJ. If you've been doing it long enough, you, you know you what the sleeve looks you like. You kind of know where a record is. You know mm. what I mean? Mm. You know, you might not even you might not even you might even know the full name of that record, but you you, you know what it looks like, and you know just by the top of the spine. And you know what, yeah, just yeah. And you know which and, 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 and you know what you know which mm. side to play. Yeah, it's the same with you know with digital <coughs> music. It's and it's kind of the same with graph. Like when you're in the dark, I think you've got to have young eyes for that. Really, these days. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, bless, bless, bless the old veterans who are still doing all that because I tell you what I can't even read a Tabasco label these <laughs> no, I, I struggle I um, struggle to read a WhatsApp without my glasses on but yeah there's obviously that I mean I remember doing it with 3D when we were younger and um, he's colour blind so it was like we used to have to write the colours on for him really wow uh, but we used to have a laugh because we used to chuck in the wrong colour and oh, like, yeah. kind of like we could mess Brown. around yeah so <laughs> he, was, he was colour blind so it was like and if you look at a lot of the early Massive Attack artwork he would do a painting and reverse the photo, the negative, and use that as the artwork. So there was that. There were some pretty wild oh, colour schemes and stuff. Yeah. Well, I've always wanted to know. I mean, now you get commissioned to do a lot of work, but yeah. surely when you started, you'd be doing stuff that was illegal. Yeah, it was all illegal when we started out. Yeah, I mean, the only what is it like? What's the, the pressure's on you? Yeah? Uh, the pressure's on, the adrenaline's pumping. But the thing is, I think the thing is then you have to master doing something quickly and doing a quality job because you, if you leave it unfinished or crap, it, people, you get laughed at. Of course you do. Yeah, you're judged on it. So you would learn to do so in a way, by doing that, you learn to do stuff quickly and more precisely so that when you've got a commission, you've got loads of time so you can just tidy up. But I still do it quickly as, mm. like that because it's How quickly can you turn around a piece? Because yeah. I've seen, I've seen videos you go quick. But yeah, 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 that's really quick. Yeah. yeah. An hour, 45 minutes for a good piece. We're talking about full burner here. We're not talking about... No with a character as well. Yeah. yeah. But that's like, you know, I, it's almost like I can't stop myself from rushing it because I'm so used to it. It's like, yeah, oh, bang, that's bang, how bang. you do it. But it's kind of good because it means you can get more done. But then, like, you know, I could spend a lot longer and make it a lot more detailed and stuff. Like, mm. you know, there's like certain of my mates that do a lot more cutbacks and like, tidy mm. all up. Mm. I mean, I think Ben Iron taught me the thing that, like, it doesn't really count in 72 DPI because no one notices all those little bits mm -hmm. that you cut back yeah, unless they go and see the wall in the flesh. And these days, unfortunately, most people just see it online. It's true. Yeah, yeah it's like, we were young. I used to travel, come to London to see pieces or, like, go to, like, you know, especially under the West Wing, that used to come down here a lot, and Trellet Tower... And then, um, you know, we used to go to Birmingham, see stuff, go to Wolverhampton where Goldie was painting. We used to travel to all the different cities to see stuff just because we knew there was graffiti there. Yeah. And it's rare to... Now people don't mm. really travel well, so fun, much. Funny yeah. you should say that. I used to have an Italian flatmate, Cristiano. She's a lovely girl. She's moved back to Italy now. She went to, she went to Bristol for the day once, right? And she liked it so much that she went back another day just to check out all the artwork yeah, and take yeah. photos of it and mm. she, you know what I mean she, just, she was fascinated by it she yeah. went all the way back to Bristol it's two separate worlds there's Bristol and then there's Bristol well, the thing is Bristol like now it's an hour and ten minutes so it's the same as going across London so to live, yeah. for me living there now I moved back there a couple of years back it's the same for me to come up here mm. as it is so for me to, to go, to go from West London to East London. Yeah. Mm. So it's like... It's, and you, what, you come yeah. into Paddington, you're right in it as well. Yeah, exactly. You've been it's on right the, you always <laughs> still see the graph for coming into Paddington, and have which there on, is a hell of a lot. Have you been on the days. Elizabeth yeah. line yet? Yeah, I have, actually. Brilliant. Yeah. Oh, no, oh, it's great. It's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, living in London isn't quite financially viable for the creative people, is it? And there's a big creative scene down there of like music and art. Oh, yeah. And the other thing... Like, it's always been a music place, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's been a thing with, it's, it's like, I mean, people go on about it and all that. You know, it is a small town. I'll be honest, it can get a bit it's boring. A small city, it isn't can it? get a bit boring. It's beautiful. But what it is, is you've got this network. I can go to a pub with like 30 graffiti or street artists guys, all sit together, chat, mix ideas, and share them. Nice. And then, you know, all like discuss what we're doing to help each other. Yeah, that's great. Whereas I did find in London, it was so big, you didn't get to meet everyone from all around the city because it's too big for everyone to yeah, travel yeah, in yeah. and I think that's what's helped Bristol in a way mm. get its kind of name out there is that it, everyone works as a team so with the music and as with mm. the art it's like everyone's in it together but with with your style and I know a lot of the Bristol Massive will concur with this like you've really forged a style a, a look a real stamp in in your, your graffiti approach, yeah. it's a, you're really identifiable. What, what's your influences? Where did How, how did that come about? Uh, my dad's an architect. He actually worked with Goldfinger on Toilet Tower. Wow, yeah, stop So it. that's why I always had quite an affinity to that. Yeah, he worked in the 60s for him doing that. Did you know that? They did Power no, on that. Tower. Oh. He, he did Elephant and Castle with him as well. I but, fucking um, love Brutalist architecture. These guys know it. I'm a yeah. fucking huge fan. So we had a lot of references there. Obviously, Art Nouveau stuff. Mm. A lot of it was going back to what I said about us being isolated, that we had to look at different things. So I was, you know, fucking taking mushrooms, looking at cheese plants and smoking weed and, 
you know, then do geometric stuff. So we were basically just trying to create different styles, constantly practicing. And we had this youth club we could go to and paint. So you had a place to practice as well as doing illegal stuff. Mm -hmm. So we managed to, you know, there's one lot of places in many cities you could go and paint. Now, but then apart from doing youth workshops or something. But I think just overall, it came to a crescendo when I think the internet started. I started seeing so much graffiti. I was like, you need to stand out. Mm. If you're going to, like, and the thing is, there were so many people doing this hip hop styles and trying to keep it. I still do a bit of that, but it's trying to do something completely unique, mm. adding your touch to it. And I always say it to any young writer, is that you've got to be unique because otherwise it won't stand out. And the thing is, if you want to be remembered, you've got to have something that's just mm. completely different from everyone else, or at least a twist to it. It's got something unique. It could be a colour palette you use, it could be a little monogram you use. I saw always doing those Art Nouveau ladies, doing that, but keeping the graffiti with it and just stamping it. And just by doing that repetitively, you kind of build your brand. Mm, That's the yes, one bit I would say to any writer out there is that if you're looking to build it as a brand, have a twist or style that's yours and mm. don't just be replicating other people's. Do you think a lot of that, because obviously you get given sketches when you begin, you're learning, yeah. you're trying things out, there's these f f guidelines that, that old graffiti writers give you, like you've yeah. got to keep this, do this, make sure that... Does that does that apply to what you're thinking there? Does that does that apply or are you thinking... Uh, I don't know, I, I always saw it as like, as I was a graphic designer as well, it became more like... Graffiti is a tool in my palette, so I've got like mm. airbrushing, spray can, I've got pencil, I've got computer design, I've mm. got typography, I've got printing, screen printing. Mm. It's all these different palettes. I'm a designer, I can use, pick and choose each one. I might take a bit of graffiti, put that into the computer, I might take a bit of computer, put that into my graffiti design. Wow. So mixing it all up, and the processes you learn, so some process you get from screen print, like translucent colours and stuff, mm. you can probably see in like Aix's work, there's a lot of translucent stuff. Uh -huh. Certain artists take things from the computer into their graffiti stuff, and it's just mixing it all up together as one sort of pot. But I still, you know, still stuff like the Tax Crew's early stuff that I saw, that's definitely was a major influence. Mm -hmm. Goldie's stuff was an influence. Mm -hmm. Dondi's stuff. Mm -hmm. the, all that. I really love that classic stuff, but to, with a twist. Mm -hmm. Do you remember so, that Goldie yeah. piece he did called Bombing? Yeah. That yeah, was yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because. Yeah. A friend of mine, he's no longer with us. Uh, he, he had that piece. His name is Christian. Yeah. He, he's, he's Christian Coral. He started Metalheads Records. Okay. Yeah. And he had it in his. And he said Goldie did that. It's bombing. It was. It, it was. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Because yeah, Goldie was living in a trailer for a bit as well. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And that so was with amazing the, artwork. The film director who did. Um, I think he did the program bombing. Gus. Yeah. His name Gus. Gus. Yeah. yeah. He had yeah. the yeah. flat yeah. and Goldie was right. yeah. But we used to go and stay with his up in Heath Town as well. <laughs> So in the early days when he was just doing graffiti before the music, so we, me and Freedy used to go up there and stay for the weekend up there. And obviously you had the tat slot, they had the whole Birmingham scene, Selly Oak with Ruff, mm -hmm. Juice, I mean, Juice and all juice. that. Juice, oh, bruv, yeah. Uh, Ruff was up there from London, VOP uh -huh. lot, you had yep. Chrysler, Tumor. Mm -hmm. There was a whole load of writers Chew in Birmingham. Well. Yeah, yeah. Chew, Chew was up there yeah. from, like, he was from further out, um, Walsall way. Yeah, that's but they were all kind of linked. And Desi was the guy. Desi, mm -hmm. bless, rest in peace, has passed away. Mm -hmm. Rest in peace. Um, yes. He was, I mean, he was stunning at the time, Desi. And then obviously around that time, you had that Bridlington event. Mm -hmm. So you had people like John 156, Neo, <coughs> rest in peace. You had Locus, all these guys from France and like Bates was there. So you had all these different guys from all around Europe. Yeah. And it was the first kind of times we'd network those people, those networks stayed in place. Yeah. So, yeah, to this day, they're still going, yeah. Fault lines to yeah. further expansion on the scene, isn't it? What's your influences, brother? What? Musically? Yeah. I, I've, I, I loved, uh, yeah, growing up, I loved, I mean, funk, disco, hip-hop, mm. reggae. Mm. That's where I draw my major influences from, you know what I mean? Because you know what it is? It's like with Goldie, for instance, who really broke down the the cultural divide between art itself and the music and then the live performance. I remember seeing documentaries with it, with him in it where there's break dancing going on to drum and bass and things like that. It made you realise actually, you know, that what your perception as a punter is of what their genre is and what specifically it's about isn't the same as the influences of what it, what it takes for them to make the music. Mm. It's a whole different kind of mm. attitude. Like, Goldie is a character he embodies all those mm. things, but his music doesn't always translate in that way. It's just an influence, isn't it? I mean, he was a proper b-boy when we Big met him. Big time, like, yeah. yeah he, had, he had the dopest, like, jackets. Yeah. 
Triple fat goose, isn't that, with the fur and all that? We went out to New York, didn't he? Was hanging out and... with all them geezers, wasn't he? Yeah, and he was just like doing that. But he was with the B-boy guys up there in Birmingham doing all that. Mm. I think it was because Martin Jones was his manager at the time. And he was also managing all the breakdance crews and that. So they were properly for that. And then I didn't see him for years and he was down here in West London. Mm. And that's when he started doing... Um, the metalhead thing and the drum, like, I think when they were doing that, the Blue Note and that, wasn't Sunday it? Sunday nights, yeah. Yeah, and then it's around the same time, like Ronnie Size and that in Bristol. Represent crew and all and that. Crust yeah. and all that started doing a similar thing, and it kind of, that's when yeah. it all went well, through. The Wall of Sound thing, yeah. I mean, metalheads would be on the Sunday night. We used to do a night there on the Wednesday night. Yeah. Wall of Sound, yeah, it was it's called Back to Mono. Yeah. It was a brilliant night. And, yeah, they they used the imagery from the Clash, you know, Combat Rock. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, Sick. The uh, it's like the army star in it, like yeah. the, like the, the old uh, World War Two jeeps. You know what I mean? The combat with that, it's like the public enemy writing, basically. Yeah, yeah, I suppose yeah. the Clash did it before public enemy. Didn't stencil it? fault. No, that's yeah. stencil, stencil fault. fault. That, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. There's potential in that stencil stuff. I hear there's a there's money to be made in that stencil stencil life. Yeah, but like, you know what? We was like you going back to his rules thing. Like it was taboo to us. Like you know, I mean, maybe we missed a trick looking back on it, but it was all about freehand drawing. And if you did stencils, you were seen as a cheat, maybe or mm. like. So we mm. weren't like even using masking tape back then. As I got older, I've done like you know, I don't really use stencil. I might use a pattern maybe or something on like a canvas or something. Mm. I might use a bit of cello tape to get a straight line across something, but uh, or I use like you know a posca pen. I think, as I said, they're all tools mm. for my graphic design thing. I would use it when I'm painting the canvas, so I don't see any difference. But I try, on a wall, I try and keep it all freehand, to be honest. Does but he use stencils? You what? Black Narat, does he use stencils? Yeah, of course he does, yeah. Right. But the thing is, the thing is what, if you look back at it, it's like, say I could go around town and do tags yeah, all weekend. But you, like, if you had a miniature wild style stenciled, Mm. And he went around, you could have put up a hundred miniature wild styles all around mm. town. And mm. like, instead of just doing tags, and that would have stood out more. I think because your man there was doing the stencils, he was getting so much up so quickly. Mm. Mm. And the predominant key places, like on the bridges at Lavender yeah. Grove, example, that it really yeah, stood yeah. out and it was different from the tags around it. This is what I was saying mm. about standing out. Mm. And um, yeah. at the time, and obviously he documented it all, got it PR'd, so he was using market and everything. Mm. So it was clever moves. If you go to the, yeah. really up my street at the if time, you, you, and I nearly, I didn't buy any of it. I was just like, nah, I'm not interested. No, I mean, yeah, and then you know, regrettably, I wish I had, but yeah, yeah, there was I mean, definitely money in stencils all, back then. I don't know if there was any more. We all slept in on that one. I mean, I remember going to his <laughs> first shows. You know what I mean? And mm. I think he. he he was going to give me a bit of art. He was mm. going to give me something. I never got around to getting it off him. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because I was, oh, I was just yeah. too busy fucking about. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Mm. gallivanting around yeah exactly I think yeah, we were all a bit like that yeah we were just yeah I'll, I'll, all I'll weren't quite sure, that, we weren't quite sure later. about it we weren't quite sure about it to be honest at the start yeah I mean yeah, it was yeah. oh yeah it's a rat it's this it's that or it's like you know it's mm. just not really to me it wasn't really graffiti mm -hmm. but if you look at all the French stuff from the 60s the student rights and that yeah. they were all doing that like way yeah. back when he just took a lot of influence from that and like he used it wisely so that's up, I got to say. Ten out of ten for finding locations, though. Yeah, yeah these yeah, locations yeah. were audacious, weren't they? You know yeah. what, though, there was a, there was definitely a period, and it was early. Uh, do you, you can clarify with this with me, because from Wall Sound point of view, um, stenciling became quite the promotional campaign. Big up Solo One as well for the sticker room. But yeah. do you remember that uh, house DJ? I think it was a house called Milo. And do you remember yeah. he did that whole... Oh, he, the Scottish guy. Yeah, yeah. he lived the, on like, the Isle of Skye or something, didn't he? Yeah, he did that whole ca stencil campaign. Yeah. And he, he took out the whole of, you know, East London. With, yeah. And this was like a music thing, just reinterpreting what, I guess, the promotional aspect of what the street art, early street art was about. But I think initially they were, a lot of the labels that were trying to get, I remember Bo, um, Boyd was getting quite a bit of that sort of stuff, was mm -hmm. sticking, but they were asking artists, I think Tyza probably got asked a bit, but quite a few artists to do this kind of illegally. And we were like, fuck off, you're mm -hmm. going to do illegal work. It's like, you've got to... You know, it's like they were expecting you to do it on the cheap. It's like go out and risk your neck for a label. It's like you fucking do it, man. Yeah, and then, a lot, and then a lot of them went into doing it with the jet washing, so it's like cleaning it off, so you mm. don't get nicked for it. Mm. Mm. And I think uh, yeah, there was a lot of that stuff. But yeah, do you I saw a bit of that jet washing. The other, thing, I think, do you remember when there was um, what was the tune? Uh, Tony Rotten. Mm. Yeah, and, and, right. yeah, and yeah. Mr B did the cover for all that and yeah. they did a photo shoot at QPR Stadium with a burning police car or something yeah yeah, yeah and it was kick off yeah. yeah Black Twang's Black Twang's album, Black, Black Twang's album it, yeah, cover yeah. yeah and it's all from Banksy yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And then when we realised all this was going on in the background, like, and I think also your man Laz was there as well, Steve, who was doing Sleaze Nation magazine. Yeah. Ah. And they did a whole episode, like, thing of that with stencils in it, give away stencils I inside. That. Yeah, so all that stuff. Literally had all the stencils there. Yeah, didn't basically, you? So you've got the magazine with, like, loads of his stencils. One of the most surreal things ever was... Q- Wall of Sound Records ha- had like an executive box at QPR yeah. and we all went to the game and I was sitting there with Louis Farou and Banksy it was hilarious <laughs> do you know what I mean because <laughs> uh, and all the times I met Banksy they looked quite similar as well, I, right? never, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, never, I never spoke to him about his artwork we, all, all we did was talk about football he's, he's yeah. a, he was like a real big Bristol mm-hmm. City fan so yeah. he just talks about football do you know what I mean we never really spoke about art and I, I remember meeting him on a, on a bus I was going out with a girl. She lived in Stoke Newington once. And I got on his, I got on his bus. And he was on the bus. And just and there again, we talked about football. I went to, he, he did a fancy dress party. He came dressed as a copper. Yeah. That was so funny. Do you know what I mean? So good. He came dressed, he had like the full out. He had the, like the, the, the stupid hat and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Something. See the intel you're getting on this podcast, people. Yeah. You're not too well, we did was talk here. about football, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I remember you come down to the city in Bristol and put, set up a massive red flare. I think you got chucked out before half time when it was a city city yeah. Rovers derby. Well, yeah, you will get in trouble for that. Yeah. And they had a pitch in Beijing after the after Rovers team went missing. One of the funniest <laughs> things ever, right? I uh, I got the train from uh, from Paddington to Bristol, and the Hulk. Two the two carriages of trains were just full of Bristol City football hooligans. And I got drink. I was drinking with them. I think we smoked a spliff with them. Maybe had a line of coke with them as well. When I got down, one of them was a really cool guy. And I said, like, I said, come to the club. Do you know what I mean? He said, no, they won't let us in. They won't let us in. I think I was playing at the uh, what was the club on the boat? Is it the no Blue Mountain? Oh, the Blue Mountain, yeah, yeah, yeah Blue, Blue Mountain. Mountain. I love that night. Yeah. yeah, Blue Mountain rocks, man. I love that. I prefer yeah. that to Thecla. Uh, it's that's green, quite controversial, it? but I do love it. And literally, when, when we arrived at the Bristol station, there was literally 200 right police waiting. Waiting for them. Waiting for them and mm-hmm. corralling them, do you know what I mean? And I, I was like, no, 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 what are you doing, officer? I'm not with them. I was felt a bit like, because like, it was I mean? when you had City against QPR, yeah. and that was always quite a big game. Yeah. They'd sort of block off all the City fans, and it's like, oh, I'd usually be in with my mates through QPR, because yeah. they'd get a ticket easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, that was always quite a weird one. I didn't really meet him up for a drink. I suppose Bristol Cardiff is a big sort of Bristol Cardiff's massive big, still, that's yeah. a good one. Because it's just over the yeah. bridge, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's just, a big rival. It's just got over the bridge. Yeah. Gets locked down for all that. Yeah. Yeah. I do love Cardiff. It's got a great, great city. city yeah, They've got it? a really good um a friend of mine, Captain's actually doing a big exhibition, the history of Welsh hip hop. Wicked big wow. up. So man. you know yeah, what? Wicked. And there's like um he's doing the whole historical thing through like flyers, graffiti, like mm. DJs, everything, and I think that's to do with the main museum in Cardiff coming up soon. Wow. So well, that's in progress at the moment. So yeah. there is something Huge. about ports in it, Cardiff support, Bristol yeah. support. They're mm. creative hubs, aren't they? Yeah. They are. Yeah, Steeped in history. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah there's like Liverpool, the uh, Liverpool yeah. as well. Yeah. The Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> Liverpool. Yeah. I mean, the uh, well. But I think more to the point is that obviously we had the Bristol. You had quite a big Windrush generation there. Mm. Yeah. And a lot of, like, say, growing up, a lot of my friends' cousins, like I was saying, we lived in New York, whatever, and we get to make it, yeah, yeah, yeah. WBLS the, 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 tapes, Wicked Molly Mole ones, and that. Yeah. all this stuff, and then a few references about hip hop, like, but visually, we only saw it on TV and stuff, but there was definitely a seed being sown that was coming in through that generation. Mm. What I wanted to ask you, yeah, yeah. is, uh, were you in Bristol when they ripped down? That uh, yeah, fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah I thought that was brilliant. That, that was, was actually some of my mates. I thought that was brilliant. Mm-hmm. My mate's wife was um, Jen, is the lady who stood on the podium afterwards. Wicked. I saw, her, Black I, I saw her interviewed, yeah. Um, but her husband was one of the guys who rolled it through and just went straight in and, like, you know... What an atmosphere. Said it's a crime of passion. What what in there. Yeah, but yeah, the whole no. thing was crazy. I mean, that, that was going... That went, that went around the world, all that. Yeah. 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 But Bristol's always, I think, had a history of being slightly off-centre mm. and against rebelling against government and doesn't like... That's well, where all the yeah. pirates come from, isn't it? Well, yeah, but if you look back, they had <laughs> massive riots there in the 1800s. There's a lot of stuff. It's always been against the central civil, government. Civil disobedience, yeah? Yeah, kind of like... Love so it. there's always been this thing in it, but the problem is now you do get quite a few people coming there for that mm. as, like, tourist, oh, right. tourist sport. Yeah. So, like, trust the fairings come down coming with down. Few, like, making molotovs and trying to start... Let's start a revolution, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, you get a Wankers. bit of that going on, like, and they'll, like, half the people arrested aren't from Bristol. Mm-hmm. But 
but at the same time, it's like it's definitely got a hotbed of that. It's like a Glastonbury like, for yeah. uh, for protest. But at the same time, it's really? like I saw something today that they're calling the English, the French, calling them frozen turnips, and it's basically saying that the you know with Brexit, no one's writing, so you've got yeah. a brain of a frozen turnip because you're not staking up, you're cold because of the yeah. heating bills. Yeah. But you're not writing, whereas in France, people get up and they're active. I think yeah. if every city got up and did something, Absolutely. Just, you know, you know, we'd, yeah, yeah. we'd get a lot more done in this country. We'd just swallow yeah. everything yeah. in this country. Yeah. Everything, we just swallow it. We, I mean, this government, for fuck's yeah. sake. But yeah. then also, I guess there is a lot of protest that just doesn't get covered. Which is a, well, which yeah. is a, yeah. a bigger issue. Yeah, but it? I think with the internet now, you know, most stuff's getting out there, but it's like yeah. if more cities actively went bang. Just watch Al Jazeera or CNN. Yeah. Even mm. CNN show you the mm. stuff that the BBC or Sky won't show That's you. Right. That's right. right. It's phenomenal. 100%. There is a revolution coming. There has to be. There has to be. has got to be coming. Yeah. No. yeah. But it's not sustainable, this... the. Just I mean, surviving, it's full stop, living... And that right. guy, Mick Lynch, how brilliant is he? <laughs> he's just great, isn't he? He's... he's He's the son of two Irish immigrants from Paddington, and he's just, I mean, he, he, he just, when you see him interviewed, he just levels them, doesn't he? Yeah. He's just like, and he, it, it's so true. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, a lot of these are frontline workers, a lot of these, mm. do you know what I mean? The ambulance, yeah. they're nurses, they're train drivers, the shit they have to put up with every day. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And they've got these old Etonians Telling them that they can't give them a pay rise. I think it's going back to what you were saying, Kelly. It's like, you know, if you were a nurse or, you know, a bus driver or whatever, you probably can't afford to live in central London. No. Yeah, if you can live in the right on the outskirts, travelling, uh, you're Stop. spending half your time working and like, half your wages on rent. It's yeah. like, that's yeah. non sustainable. Of course it is. So I think it's definitely something that's got to change, and I think the people really need to stand up a bit about it. So. Mm-hmm. Vote with your feet, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, on that note, what is the future? Dale, what is the future for you? Fucking hell. That's a very expensive question. Oh, hey, I live it's in the moment. Mo- I live in the moment, man. Today's a good day. I'm, I'm here with here with two of my homies. We've mm-hmm. been threatening to do this <laughs> for yeah. a while. Hey, so you made the connect happen, I'm, brother. I'm so Fantastic. pleased. It's been a good day already. I don't know the. I, I can't let the cat out of the bag. I think the future. You know, I, I'm uh, I'm a bit older now, a bit wiser. Mm. You know, I've. I'm going to get back into making music, you know, because I, I kind of miss it. Come on. I'm going to get back into DJing uh, yes. live, live and direct. I may have to uh, I may have to embrace technology, but what the hell. Mm. I, f- I, I believe you can teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah, or even yeah. just come with your classic Delage tricks. Yeah, oh, yeah absolutely. That, you know, there's a market for that out there. Fucking great. That makes my fucking yeah. day, bro. I yeah. love that you're going to do it. Yeah. Back I might, I might even start doing some artwork, eh? Okay? Mm. I think we were chatting, got, we were chatting earlier about the guys, here. like people like Shindig and that, they'd love to have you playing those kind of things, yeah. I'm sure, like, you know? I'll be back at the... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How exciting. Yeah. Isn't that something? Revelation exclusive on the podcast, I guess, fast <laughs> Coming up, coming at you. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Inky? What, what, what's the uh, future, my brother? I don't know, some more... I think I'm going to go into some more 3D stuff, trying to make some sculpture at the moment. Nice. nice. And some layered stuff. I don't know, not like mobiles, but stuff where you can hang it on the wall, but it's got depth to it and a bit more. But also, I've been experimenting with loads of old techniques like mosaics Ooh, and nice. copper and stained glass. I'm trying to mould them all into one with a, wow. bit of, with a bit of laser cutting and modern technology. So using like CNC routing, etc. what you've got now, using all that equipment to make something that looks old with a kind of graffiti kick to it. So it's like antique graffiti. You're mind, bro. Like, you yeah. never stop, do you? There's all, he's, 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 a, he's a mad scientist. He's an alchemist. Well, you yes. just got, the way I see it, if you keep yourself busy, you keep yourself... Chirpy, mm. and every time you make something, it's that you've made something new to the world. Mm. So it's like if you keep creating stuff, I think you'll keep yourself happy, and you can also help other people get happy as well. So, See. well, I'm a massive fan of his artwork. Yeah. I think oh, I'm a massive fan of yours as well. I've mate. Got, uh, long time, long, long time, time I've got some of his stuff, man. He, he he gave me a beautiful piece. You remember on a yeah, yeah, on yeah. a wing and a prayer that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you've been a long-time lo- hero of mine, my brother. I love it. So I love his stuff. I love I'll seeing it. I'll have to get it. something up in for you as well. You? <laughs> yes, yes. So if there's any room. We'll make space. We <laughs> can't, must. I can't be going over certain people up here. <laughs> no, <laughs> we'll, fix, we'll fix it up. Don't you worry about that. Ladies and gentlemen, we are out like in was out of fashion. Big shout out to everybody for tuning in. Big shout out to Derek Delage. And Thanks for having us. Place. Thank yes, you, man. Yes. 
And morning with the homies. Can't get better than that, can we? Uh, Sharon is Karen. You know what it is. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Uh, crime don't pay, but neither do they. I say it every day. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, don't talk to anyone else. I wouldn't. You stay lucky, people. Cheers, boys. Later. Cheers, boys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, she like that. Ooh. That was wicked, man. <laughs> <laughs>